Damien Shifley and his wife Karen and their three children attend the Christadelphian Church or Ecclesia that meets at Busselton, which is 200 kilometres south of Perth in Western Australia. Damien joins Wilderness Conversations and shares his story and the circumstances that brought him and his family to Busselton. Damien, thanks very much for joining Wilderness Conversations. Thanks, Steve. Before we get into what you're doing now with your life, I'm really keen to hear about your background. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and um, how you came to faith. Okay, yeah, it's a fairly um, fairly standard um, sort of story, but um, I was actually born into, uh, my parents were Catholics, so they were probably fairly devout Catholic, and um, hence the name Damien, you don't come across too many Christadelphians called Damien, but it's a great name if anyone's looking for a name. <laughs> um, but yeah, so born into a Catholic family and um, my parents, they were looking, things weren't working out that well. They were sort of young married um, with, with um, three young children at that stage. They ended up having five and... Um, yeah, they they were looking um, that um, for for the truth. They, they came across the truth and, through a friend at work, and they converted. And my mother, um, she's quite academic. Um, she, she was at university in the, in the sixties. She ended up becoming a teacher. And, and my father was also, you know, very he, he could work things out pretty quickly. So when they came across, across the truth, it, it was uh, a massive change for them. It, it was a bright light. Um, that they, they were convinced the way that, you know that they were living um, that, that there was a fair chance they could end up in hell, and um, and they took that seriously. Um, we sort of can laugh a little bit about about that, but they were generally concerned about where they were going in life. So it was a concern about the their lifestyle as well as what they believed it seems. Yeah, yeah, a bit, bit of their past, uh, you know, the 60s and, and um, yeah, and also what was starting to, so in, uh, mid-70s, early, yeah, mid-70s now, and, and the, co- the Cold War was, was you know, yeah, on and people were very, very concerned about their future. So it's probably not all that dissimilar to today, mm. um, the current world environment. So they were definitely looking, and um, and they came across the Christadelphians, and, and and yeah, things just opened up for them, and um, they they really, uh, my mum in particular, studied her Bible, and uh, and you know examined everything that they said. And uh, found it to be correct, and and, and you know they, they were convinced that this was the truth. That would have created um, some conflict in their their family and yeah. friends, because that would be a complete change of lifestyle, I imagine. Yeah, it was a massive change, and it, being new zealous converts, um, you know, they probably wouldn't didn't really go about it the best the best way, not knowing uh, um, how to explain this to family and friends, and. There was a fair bit of cutting off of um, on both on both sides of the family, and some some of those uh, family rifts were never healed, but the majority um, did, did heal over time. And um, but they they came they came uh, 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 to the truth, and um, they were you know straight in and involved. Very much, um, whatever was happening, they they were in in the centre of. Yeah, they they took it very seriously. Was this in Perth? Yeah, it's in Perth. So, um, per- Perth for those that don't know, it's quite an isolated city in Australia, and it was relatively it's relatively small. It's grown a lot in recent years, but. Um, yeah, it was an isolated environment, and and there were just a small number of ecclesias that were very active, and and they got got involved in in, in everything that was that was going on. 
probably uh, a, a key thing that sort of happened to us as, as a family was we took a trip to a Adelaide. Um, I would have been about 12, so it's mid-80s. We drove across the Nullarbor, and the Nullarbor only had been recently sealed, so you had a bitumen road to drive along, and for those... I didn't realise it was that late that it was sealed. Yeah, yeah it, was fairly, it was fairly late. Mm, the, the, okay. Yeah, and yeah, so it was a... 2700 kilometre trip. So it was a three day trip with five kids. And it's a long way. It's a long way. And uh, we, yeah, we went went to Adelaide to, as Adelaide being the nearest city, and, and we knew there were a lot of Christadelphians in Adelaide. And uh, we went to, they had end of year studies on, and we attended those end of year studies. And and it was quite quite an interesting experience. We were warmly welcomed. Uh, we were invited out most nights. We were going to different people's houses, and people were really keen to meet us. And and that that trip probably had a big impact upon my parents. Um, prior to to that, um, they were more. They were, they were probably what would sort of say fairly hard line uh, in their approach. And they met some um, people there that had some good discussions with them and, and spoke to them about um, different approaches um, to, to living the truth. And and um, and that had a big impact upon, upon the family. Um, so when we returned um, to Perth, yeah, we we changed tact um, a bit. We we changed uh, ecclesia. We, a new ecclesia had formed, which was Gosnells, and we joined that, which was a very young ecclesia with lots of teenagers and lots of kids, and it was a really really active and happy environment. And um, that that's where I sort of spent all my teenage uh, years was at Gosnells, and we would have had a hundred kids in the youth group. And we got involved in all the camps and, you know, conferences that you could go to uh, and trips trips to Adelaide or Sydney, um, wherever um, something was on, we, we tried to get to. And uh, that, that was great. So I really enjoyed my teenage um, years, but we, we'd sort of brought, we were sort of taught that we were separate. And we practiced being separate. Um, so you, you didn't mix with the kids at school. You, you mixed mm. solely in Christadelphian sort of circles. And, and that, that had quite an impact upon me. Um, I became very uncomfortable in, in a school environment um, if anyone knew that I was religious or I, I kept that quite hidden while I mm. never doubted God, I, I've always believed in God. Um, I became very uncomfortable around people that weren't weren't Christadelphians, and I really became quite introverted. In in uh, would, I would not express my faith, but if I went um, in in a an ecclesial environment, I was um, you know right right in with the mix of, of it, and very happy to. To talk, so so I had this, you know, through my teenage years, and they're, they're always awkward years. Um, yeah, I developed this hide, hiding my faith, um, and I, I sort of got, I got baptized around eighteen, um, and I started to go to university, and I sort of made a decision that this this has to stop um when i meet someone or I, I start somewhere new i'm going to be straight out with it you know i'm i'm a christian and i'm going to tell people i'm a christian and i'm going to be quite proud of it mm. and sort of again what happened sort of around that time um you know one of my my friends um, ended up having uh, getting a, a girlfriend and she she wasn't a christadelphian and she ca came along and I, I was absolutely amazed at her faith, just the way she could talk to anyone about what she believed. And I thought, I want to be like that. I, I want to be able to talk to whoever I meet and tell them who I am and, you know, what what excites me. I want to be as confident at talking about 
Jesus, the gospel, as I am about talking about my favourite football team. And that that was sort of a goal that I set myself. So, you know, uni days were, yeah, you know, I did it well sometimes and didn't other times. And then I, I moved into the work environment. And as I got older, I, I sort of, I got better um, at being true to, to, to who I was. But it took a it took a lot of work. What was the inspiration for the for the change of view? Yeah, the fact that you could be confident in your beliefs. You could be what what you've got is not not strange. It's something to to celebrate. It's good news, mm. and it, it should be shared. And all the verses in the Bible talking when Jesus, you know, if you're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of you, and those sort of verses sort of struck home to me. I thought, oh, I've got I've got to change when I read those, those verses. I don't think your story is unique. I think um, mm. there, there is a confusion, particularly, and it's probably just uh, an interpretation of younger people growing up in the environment where parents kept them very separate for all of the right reasons. Yeah. And so you end up living this separate life and it's almost... So, mate, you must have two lives. Yeah, that's what I, I discovered. I, I was living two lives, um, you know, a, a devout life and, and a not so, you know, a not so devout life. And yeah, I, I realised that this was tearing me apart. And and you, you can't you can't go on being being two different people. So yeah, so I, I ended up going through the normal courses. Went to a New Zealand conference. And I met my wife, um, Karen, and she was from Adelaide. And uh, we, we started up a relationship and a couple of years later we got married and I convinced Karen to, to move to Perth as, as a good option. Well done. Yeah, yeah what was, it, yeah. It, and you're still there? We, no, well, we're in Western well, Australia. You're still in Western yeah. Australia. So, so we did our um, time in in early early marriage in Perth, and uh, again, very involved, running youth groups and camps, and and uh, travelling to various places. And as most normal sort of married couples, you set yourself a couple of years, and then you start thinking about having having kids. And it's time to sort of settle down in, in your sort of late twenties. You start to get a bit more serious about having kids. And sort of what was interesting for us was we couldn't have kids, and that became quite, quite a challenge. In fact, we were married eleven years before we had our first child, and um, yeah, and that that puts enormous challenges on. On uh, just your relationship, um, and um, yeah, and just dealing with with something that you think would be so simple, but it ends up very challenging. So we live in a community which is very geared, and and rightly so, around family life. Yeah. So, and and um, not having the family and being now too old to be in the youth group side of things, you fall into a little bit of a, a gap between between the families mm. and and the um and the younger the younger group. So we decided that we would take a year off. We were that that's that's it. We're gonna go overseas for a year and we we'll um We'll just have a good year and and see see what happens and and that's what we did. So we um we actually went and lived in Switzerland uh, for a year. Um, I had a Swiss passport and I could work in Switzerland, and we knew. That so it was because your dad was Swiss. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, yeah, we knew there was an ecclesia in Germany as well. So we we went to Switzerland. We worked in in the mountains and. Every three to four weeks, we'd travel up to Germany, and and we went to a German Bible school. We'd meet with the German brethren and sisters, and that was an eye opener for me because I it was a new ecclesial environment. Um, it was a different language. Things were done differently to the, what I was used to, 
and um, and they had this incredible spirit um, where where um, yeah that they they were warm, they were friendly. Uh, we got invited to a wedding, which was just a great experience, and um, and we, we invited them down to Switzerland because I was working at a youth hostel and there's plenty of accommodation, and groups of young people would come down and spend a weekend with us. So th there was a lot, yeah, a lot going on that year, and it was totally out of the norm for us, which was a, a not. You know your working environment plus your very busy ecclesial environment. Mm. We we had a, a year where we could really consolidate, grow, think about um, a, a lot of things. So it sounded like it broadened your mind, which travel does very much so, very much so. And so we we returned. We were actually in um, in Switzerland when September eleven happened. And um, after that happened, we thought, oh, look, it's time to go home. We, you know, a war's going to break out pretty soon. Mm. We don't know what's happening. You know, the return of Christ is that just around the corner. We, we don't know. Mm. So let's get home. Let's see what everyone's saying at the meeting. So we, we returned home. And after you've been away for a while, returning back to home is always a di very difficult experience so yeah it can be hard to settle back in yeah it? yeah it took a while to settle back in and in fact we weren't really settled and i kept getting job off offers um to move to the southwest of wa so what's what sort of work do you do i'm a uh, property valuer so okay so uh, there was a lot of uh, demand it's a growing area there's lots of lots of various properties that i, I can look at so I moved to the I moved to Bustleton, um, which is two hours south of Perth. It's a little coastal community town of about twenty thousand, and um, yes, yeah, it's, it's just a beautiful environment. Uh, don't really know why I moved to the southwest, other than I kept getting job offers and thought maybe it's. I should follow that. So it's still just the two of you at this it's just stage. Just the two of us, yeah, no, no kids. And again, it was like we're sort of settling into life, thinking, well, we probably can't have kids. Let's do things that are interesting. So just on that subject, because it's it's not uncommon. I mean, yeah. there'd be people listening that are in that position. How how do you cope with that? And is it something you just learn to deal with? Yeah, you learn to deal with it. It's not every day is a bad day. It's you, you, you might be fine for a couple of months and and then you might be sad for a couple of days and then then, then you're fine again mm. it's um it's not it's just it's, it sits it, in the background it sits in the background it just nag it nags away yeah uh, and we sort of yeah it was just a big it was a challenge mm. and um it was a probably a bit a bit of a bigger challenge for us in terms of Karen being adopted and her parents having to go through it again, and mm. um, but we we moved to the southwest and we went round looking for Christadelphians that ha were in the region, and there was there was a few, and there was two old sisters that had sort of met in a home for twenty years, and everyone sort of had forgotten them and we started meeting with them and then there was a couple of families moved to nearby towns and then a couple of fa more families came down and and joined us and before we knew it we had a little ecclesia that was that was going and yeah, we did some bible seminars and we got a convert in um to the meeting so it was, it was quite exciting times and sort of during this this period, um, Karen got pregnant, and um, we had our first child. So, so that would have been something. That was that was amazing. So, um, and uh, yeah, so it brought a lot of joy to, to the family, to the grandparents. It would have been hard to believe. I mean, after so how many years? Eleven years. So, so after eleven years, yeah, all of a sudden we got a child. That yeah. seems extraordinary. Yeah. So. So yeah, it was it was um, it was great, and uh, number two followed fairly soon after, 
and a little bit of a gap in with uh, our third, um, we our son was born, so so it was quite quite exciting. So we became very established in a small community, and being in a small community, like we're social creatures, and I talk to everyone I'd come across, and so you'd know you would know a lot of people in the town. In the town, we you know a lot of people, and Bustleton's yeah. quite quite unique. There, there's quite a strong conservative religious group in town is there and okay. that basic we have a bible school every year bustleton bible school it's on the um the banks of the the Ge geograph bay it's absolutely beautiful and um it's in this strip of land it's known as locally as the holy mile it's about <laughs> yeah, it's a mile long and it's probably about 10 15 campsites and it, it all alone by different yeah, churches. Yeah, and... you can go along in that Catholics <laughs> and the Anglicans and the Baptists, and and you go through and you you pick your your. So which one do we hire? Well, we hire the Baptist one. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We skip over the Anglicans, Anglicans and the Catholics Anglican and... one that isn't as good. So we actually take up two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so we we combine two. In fact, we're probably almost m moving into a a third these these days. Um, so it's quite a big Bible school. Yeah, it's a it's a great Bible school. And um, when our kids started going to school, they went to the local Christian school. Um, and and you, you meet a lot of you meet a lot of people from various religions. And I'd be at a barbecue or something, and there's like three or four pastors, yeah, you know, that I knew that you know the pastor from the Anglicans, um, Uniting Church, and all the various churches. The so, um, Church of Christ would be the main ones. So I'd always talk to them, and I'd always want to talk about the Bible to, with them. And it gets back to me. Wanting to express what I believe and, and and talk to people and sort of what I've found is when I'm talking to other Christians, I'm not not into point scoring or proving that I know something that they don't know. I'm I'm wanting a conversation about about Jesus, about what inspires them, um, how they live their lives what I think about what I've found really interesting. With the pastors, I treat them probably a little bit different um, because they should know a lot more and I I probably talk to them more about doctrine and yeah. what what's in, what's important. It, so that's talking with Christians. When I'm talking with um, non-Christians, it's totally different conversations. You're not so much talking about the Bible. You're more talking about apologetics. So it's a different um, style of conversation. It might be why, why I believe in creation, um, proofs that God exists, and I come across... Um, People that are very good at this would be um, John Lennox. Um, you, you might have seen his debates with Richard yeah. Dawkins. So I, I tend to find um, people that, that are opposed to Christianity have probably been exposed to Richard Dawkins and they s tend to trot out Richard Dawkins' arguments, which on the face of it, when you're here in the first time, they, 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 they're tough. Um particularly if you're just coming from a Sunday school level. But if you've um, started to read a bit of John Lennox um, or, or listen to William Lane Craig um, arguing the existence of God because of right and wrong, mm. yeah, you get you get some some really good good conversations going. Is there any one particular argument that you think is more effective than others that you've that you tend to lean on? Um, I like the case for Christ argument. So, um, so that's uh, the story of the resurrection, the story of the empty tomb, mm. um, and yeah. So there's a movie um, out, Case for Christ. If you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing it. it, it, it no, I haven't seen it. Oh, it lays out the argument. It's a mo it's a fairly um, recent movie, actually, probably okay. 10, ten or so years. It lays out that argument 
for the risen Christ in in a very strong in a very strong way. So it's by establishing the facts and then argue and then and then asking what the most likely explanation is. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I love I love that argument. Um, and yeah, I'd really encourage you to have a look. And it's a fantastic. Yeah, well, mm. um, it's a fantastic movie for particularly your, your teenagers. Um, it's probably a more modern version of Who Moved the Stone. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. So yeah, but I, I tend to be most comfortable talking talking with Christians. And there was one particular pastor. Um, he's, he's a pretty fiery um, South African. Baptist pastor, and he took it upon himself to to take me on, and you know he was going to fix you up. Wasn't he was he? going to fix me up, and he, he's the same age as me, and he reminds me of my sort of younger self that was um, less tolerant, narrow minded, and um, and so I was always. He came round and, and gave me a big serve on the Trinity, and I wasn't quite expecting it. And after a couple of hours, I said, oh, I sort of said, "Oh, that's enough, mate." So he gave me a few verses to to have a look at, and I, de- I was determined. Okay, what am I going to do here? I'm going to actually study this subject and and come up with with the answers. I'm going to answer every single verse he's given me, and. And they, they they know their verses pretty their proof verses pretty well, and they're, they're the standard Genesis one twenty six. God said, "Let us." Yeah. Mm. Alex John one John one Philippians two. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, yeah. The, there's half a dollar. Uh, Thomas, um, the risen Christ, my, my Lord, my God. God. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So you got the classics. Um, Jesus saying before Abraham, I am. Um, yeah. the are your, your standard um, verses. So I, I got right into it, and I um, I went sort of looking, um, looking. So I started with sort of rested scriptures. I um, looked around, and then I thought I want to get on to the internet and find out are there other non-trinitarians out there and what do they have to say and and how well versed are they and after looking around a bit i came across the unitarian christian alliance um this was actually probably before they actually um made made this alliance um i came across a new york pastor same age as as myself sean finnegan he had a podcast called restitutio yeah, and so I, li- I listened to him and I found him fascinating. Um, he he held Unitarian beliefs. Um, most of his beliefs were pretty much identical, um, representative atonement, uh, didn't uh, believe in um, the in hell. Um, probably the main difference was uh, li- they believe in a literal devil. Mm. Uh, I've heard I've heard some of his podcasts actually. Yeah, yeah, he's very easy to listen to. Um, it's interesting. He's an inter- he's an interesting guy because he he's he doesn't believe in the Trinity, but he's okay fellowshipping people that do. He doesn't actually yeah. see it as being um, critical for salvation, which is interesting. Yeah, 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 and, and yeah. So that's also um, that, that's another story. That's I guess. another story. So there's a there's a whole group of them, um, there, and quite a. A lot of them um, have degrees in theology. I wrote to him and asked him, "How'd you get a degree in theology if you're non-Trinitarian?" And he said, "Oh, good question." But uh, there's the Atlanta Bible College, which is for um, Unitarians, and that's where he got his undergraduate degree. And he's also um, got a degree in early church history. So quite quite fascinating. Um, they're, they're bright guys. There's another guy there, uh, called Bill Schlegel. And he he has the One God report, and he he was a Baptist professor in Jerusalem. Um, I saw one of his talks. He was using slides which were uh, watermarked Lean Rickmeyer. So I sent him a message. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. He goes, yeah, I know Lean. 
um, because they've spent time together in, in Jerusalem. And he, over time, suddenly um, became, went from Trinitarian to Unitarian. And he lost his job. He, I don't think he realised he was going to lose his job over it, but he he got fired ended up um, back in America. And because these guys are really, really bright guys, they their understanding of Scripture, and once, once they've <laughs> got it all connected, um, their arguments are, are, are incredible. So, um, I, I heard Finnegan um, interview Jeff... Uh, Dubell, who wrote Christ Before Creed. That's right. So, who's actually an Australian who wrote that book. It's actually quite a good book. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So he... Um, and he he lost his pastor position as a result of his non-Trinitarian view. Yeah, so he he was uh, Church of Christ, but he stayed in the Church of Christ. And I, again... But he stayed listened, in the church. Yeah, I, when yeah. I listened to him, I thought, look, you're in Sydney, there's, <laughs> there's you know, like-minded uh, yeah. people that, that you could meet with. Yeah, and yeah, there's another guy, uh, Dale Tuggy, as well, who's got a podcast called Trinities, and uh, you see, yep. um, he's he's quite uh, prevalent in YouTube at the moment. Yeah, so you've got these little um, two minute clips or one minute clips, mm. and they're they're really powerful little arguments. Um, so a, a lot of the information that they've put out, um, they can be two or three minute um, little cartoon sort of style. Um, presentations it's very high high quality and but going back to that subject of the fact that they don't think the trinity is real yet they still fellowship and still go along to the same church i do get the sense that it's somewhat academic to them yeah um and it doesn't translate into the fact that if you do believe in the trinity it's a completely different god right uh, and a completely yeah. different style and like it's for me, it's most of these. Are, I don't understand their ability to stay at the church. Yeah, no, most of these have been kicked out of churches, or, or they they're running churches that are Unitarian. Okay. Yeah, and they're fully across Christadelphian, um, Christadelphians as well. They um, they describe Christadelphians as their cousins. Right. <laughs> it's sort of like the closest. But most of them would still believe in the devil. A uh, literal devil. Mm. Yeah. Um, Mm. And that would be the, the the biggest the biggest sticking point on 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 the subject. So yeah, I, I used a lot of their material um, because it's easily available, and and it's good. It's um, and so I went down the, the path of. And what's sort of interesting too is um, talking to this Baptist pastor. He was saying the numbers are on his side. You know, you, you don't have the numbers. Um, and I also said, well, you should have just started Catholic. <laughs> you know, what's the point? <laughs> what, if you're going to argue numbers, um, what's the point of the, the Reformation? When you're talking to people about the Trinity, most Trinitarians don't understand what they're saying, as in they don't understand the subject. Um, and why it's so interesting is as soon as you deny the Trinity or, or the deity of Christ, you are labelled by a Christian, Trinitarian Christian, you know, as being part of a cult. So it's in, one that's ingrained in most people become very, very suspicious of you as soon as you deny the Trinity. And that's been taught to them um, that we've got this doctrine that we don't fully understand and if someone questions it, they're not. Or they'll tell you you're not Christian. Mm. Now, when you dig a bit bit deeper, and there there was a, a study uh, every two years, uh, I think it's called Ligonia uh, Institute, which is a Trinitarian. Um, it's, it was run by a guy called Sproul, who was um, an avid. He, he was an authority on the Trinity. And he he does a study every two years about the the health of the Christian movement, particularly in America, and how doctrinally sound they are. And what they discover is about thirty percent of Christians can accurately express um, the 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 um, Trinity, right? Or the creed of the Trinity. Yeah, or or yeah, it can give you a, an explanation that is not. Uh, um, heretical. Mm. 
of that group, there's about another thirty percent that if they wrote down their understanding, they'd be Unitarian. Yeah, um, and it's interesting. Even yeah. Bill, you mentioned Bill Lane Craig. Um, even he, yeah. his version of the Trinity is very sparse because yeah. he knows he, he, the more he says, the more trouble he gets into. That's so right. he says this very tiny doctrine of the Trinity, which he expresses in about one sentence and avoids all of the creedal stuff because he says, well, that's not in the Bible. And so he ends up with this little sort of mini statement that it's almost hard to argue against because it really doesn't actually say much. Yeah, uh, Dale Tuggy's taken him on um, in re very recent times. You can actually um, see a bit of that debate um, on on the subject of the Trinity. So th that's quite, quite interesting as well. So yeah, about 30% of, of People that go to church don't believe are actually Unitarian, but because church, and this is what I sort of find with people when I'm talking to them, they'll say to me, "Yeah, I don't really believe that," mm. um, but I'm in a in an environment with my family, my friends that caters for my kids. I'm so socially connected to this group. I'm not leaving this group because of. Uh, a difference of of understanding, and uh, yeah, so I've had yeah had a lot of um, a lot of discussions, particularly uh, with this pastor who who you know wanted to show me that I would would not be saved um, if I denied the the Trinity, and I set him that challenge. And he hasn't been able to, to to actually prove that. If you're talking to someone about the Trinity, is there a couple of go-to ideas, verses yeah, I, that you go to, to to express what you believe in the positive, as opposed to sort of arguing the toss over a couple over Philippians two or John one? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a few. There's a sort of few things. Talking to Christians too, they they believe the Trinity, but they some have this idea of a hard Old Testament God. And a soft, loving Jesus, which mm -hmm. is, which is, yep. again, you know, Jesus is the perfect representative of God. If Jesus is soft, God is soft. If and loving, yep. you, you, you don't have it. Actually, doesn't make sense. It doesn't yep. it, that doesn't make sense? In fact, it would make more sense for us who believe that Jesus is different to God. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, if, that, if if anyone was going to go with yeah. that line, it would be us, yeah. not them. And, and what I sort of found looking at the, at this subject is, I actually got a greater understanding of Jesus, a closer relationship of, of Jesus, mm. and, and and it was more more inspiring. Yeah. The Son of God, the Son of Man, di didn't sin. Um, and, and yeah, it sort of means something, doesn't it? It's not a facade. Yeah. Or, or, a, or a sort of fake sort of idea. Yeah. So when, when I'm talking, I actually like the, um, the probably John 10 example where the disciples, uh, where the, sorry, Pharisees are going to stone Jesus for, for blaspheming, for making himself equal to God. And I find Jesus's answer just absolutely inspiring when he says, "Well, you know," he basically to paraphrase, he says, "Big deal, you are gods." Mm. The, the scripture says, "You are gods." You want to stone me for for being God, and that is an incredible argument because he's quoting Psalm eighty-two. If you go to Psalm 82, it's talking about the Elohim, but we're talking about the Elohim being condemned for being, um, for not doing their job, for 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 being God's representative, but doing it so poorly that God's condemning them. And they got that. They understood that Jesus was having a go at them, and they understood the the Jewish concept, like when they're accusing um, Jesus of of making himself God or making himself equal to God. That they they understand the power of what we'd call agency or God manifestation or similar concept when you have. You know the power of attorney. If you give mm. me the power of attorney over you, I am you. I can go buy a house yep. in your name. I can make all these decisions as though I'm you. And you know the Jews understood the person who is sent is equal to the sender, and, and mm. the Pharisees knew 
Jesus' claim, as he says later in in John 10, being the son of God, was one of agency, that the son of God was equal to God. But the, the Pharisees never believed in the Trinity. Like They, they knew he wasn't wasn't God. Mm. And But Jesus flipping it straight back on to them, saying, hang on a minute, with agency, you are God too. And you're such a bad represent, representation of God, you're going to be condemned along with those in, in that were condemned in um, Psalm 82. So that argument tends to, like, I've taken my, my Baptist friend there. Yeah, it stumps them in, in the fact that they've got to go to Psalm 82. Is it actually talking about humans or is it talking about, who, who's it talking about? And, and, yeah, you get some really wild theories. I suppose you can, you can link that then with John 17, Christ's Prayer. Yep. About us being one with him as he is one with God. Yeah. It's it's sort of a the similar principle, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's sort of another sort of tricky thing that, that's done even in John one verse one, you know, and that it's good really good to have a look at. Like in, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So there's a couple of things that, that you need to understand there. And what a Trinitarian does is they change they change the definition of God. It occurs twice in that first sentence. And they basically read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Father, and the Word was the Eternal Son. That's their understanding. So they've changed the word Theos from the Father to the Son. Now, John is an incredibly sophisticated writer and he, he writes and he, he, he gives us the reason why he's written this gospel. He's given us the reason. He's, he's written it to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. That's, that's his mission statement. And you should never discredit an author when he says, this is why I'm writing. Oh, John 20, he says that, right? Yeah. Mm. So, you know, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Father, and the Word was the Father. So that, that gives us the challenge. How do we make sense of that? And, you know, was there anyone, do we have an example, was there anyone that was with God and was God in the Old Testament, if we think about it? And if you think a little bit more, the, the person that's described the most as being with God is Moses. And he's also described as God. So, so you've actually got you've actually got a human that that um, uh, and a template there to, there to work with uh, in, in the understanding of of and again it comes down to agency or or God manifestation if, if you like the older term um, that yeah you are you are God if you act like God and uh, and that, that that's the only way to sort of make sense of that verse mm. but yeah so in Russelton have you had much success preaching the truth in that area well, sort of, uh, we did initially yeah uh, when we um, we started we've got a, a meeting of probably 15 or so baptized and um, you know a few families have joined um in more recent times and people have come down here to retire yeah if you're sort of listening to the po podcast and you're you're driving home in a major in a major city and you know your commute's an hour and a half um there, there are other places in Australia where you can live where property is a lot cheaper and um and life can be a lot easier this is an Advertisement to come to sunny Bustleton. Yeah, yeah, look it up. Direct flights at the moment from Bustleton to Melbourne and Bustleton to Sydney. Um, so yeah, we've got an airport, and um, so you can fly from Sydney direct to Bustleton. Started this month. So it's amazing. Yeah, I'll see. So it's half an hour away from Margaret River. You might have heard of Margaret River. So it's a good, really good part of the world. So if you if you do venture uh, down this way. I make sure you you look us up. So you've been living there. Your kids are getting older now. They're teenagers. What was it like bringing up children in in a 
remote area. Well, it's not that remote, but outside of Perth. Yeah, it, it's good. Um, you obviously um, ha- have a lot of time to to spend with them and um, and watch them grow up. We were l- lucky to have um, another family in our meeting with old, older kids, and we sort of watched what they they d- did as their kids went through teenage years and and then moved on to university. And I think our kids will follow a, a similar path. But I think what's important is to um, get them to all the conferences and the camps all around Australia and so that they can make strong friendships. Um, and we sort of started that process. Our oldest daughter went off to Adelaide Conference. And um, the more you can expose your kids to other Christadelphian kids and and the social structures that we enjoy, um, the better it is for them. No plans to move back to Perth or anything like that? No, not at this stage. And, you know, the children might actually end up in Perth or another city around Australia and um, make their own way. Damien, thanks very much for joining Wilderness Conversations. Well, thanks for the chat.